Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with Enna Reitort, author of the profound and revealing book, Creevda, God Tricks Against the Matrix. As Paul shares in this podcast, Enna's book unexpectedly arrived on his 60th birthday, and as soon as he read a few chapters, he immediately knew he had to track Enna down to interview her for his podcast. Enna is an incredible woman with tremendous depth and character, as you are about to experience yourself. She has three master's degrees and a PhD in anthropology, as well as being a professional past-life regression therapist. Enna has extensive experience living with subsistence-level people in India, Bangladesh, and currently in Thailand. She has been deeply involved in grassroots spiritual movements and is an experienced mediator. She is a professional interpreter and has an extensive background in the study of the entomology of words, particularly the ancient languages and words specific to world scripture. Today's episode is the first session of four devoted to a deep exploration of the God Tricks Against the Matrix and the history of the enslavement, brainwashing, impoverishing, and control of human beings by the gods and the uber-rich, and how these very tactics are being used against the public worldwide today. In this podcast, Emma dialogues with Paul on the importance of being careful with words and their power and meanings. They explore human origins and the presence of gods in the ancient history of humanity. As you begin this special exploration of Krivda, the God Tricks Against the Matrix, it is very important to keep an open mind. Both Enna and Paul encourage you to listen from your heart and always be willing to challenge your own programming by asking, is it really true? If you find yourself getting upset at what Enna or Paul share from their extensive studies of the issues at hand, it is a good indication that you have defensive strategies built into your own programming. But now you know right where to look to begin your own healing and rebuild that programming. At this time in the world, it is essential that we all take responsibility for healing our past programming so we can look at the world with fresh eyes and access our creativity. As Einstein stated, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. Enjoy this very powerful dialogue with Enna Reitort, a truly wise, highly educated, skilled, seasoned human being for whom Paul has the utmost respect. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have a very, very interesting guest who has written an incredible book called Krivda. She taught me how to say it. It's the book is Krivda, The God Tricks Against the Matrix by Anna Reitort. And Anna was kind enough to send me this book, which came unexpected out of the blue. And when I opened the book, I, as soon as I saw the cover, <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, this is my kind of book. And so, uh, I wish I could show you the cover, but we had connection challenges today, so we had to drop the video, but it's an absolutely incredible book, and the subtitle, The God Tricks Against the Matrix, tells a lot about what it's all about, but this book came to me fairly close to the beginning of the whole COVID pandemic, and when I opened the book and looked through the table of contents, I went, oh my God, this is awesome. And I started reading the book and I was absolutely blown away. And so I got a hold of Anna and we had a meeting and began a dialogue. And I'm super excited to have Anna here. So Anna, welcome to Living 4D. I'm really, really excited to go through as much as we can of this amazing book that you wrote. Thank you so much, Paul. And well, thank you for thank you for giving a little bit of time to well somebody who is completely completely unknown, not on the map, um, and you know that's really really appreciated. And I you know I I I admire your openness of mind and the you know the three hundred sixty sort of vision that you seem to have. Over everything. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, I, I read I read a couple of chapters of the book with my very busy schedule. I want to read the whole thing, but I've just got this is 
such a beautiful book and so deep and so honest. I, of the chapters I read, they're almost all highlighted in yellow and, and underlined in red and double underlined. I just went, you know, from page to page and left piles of notes. And I just thought, my God, the world has got to read this book because it's just unveiling so much of the truth that's so relevant to what's going on in the world today. So what we, what for those of you listening, what I did is I mapped out with Anna a series of four podcasts to really give her work the attention that it needs, because I think everything we're going to talk about is absolutely critical to what's going on in the world today. But before we get into it all, um, I'd like it, Anna, if you could give us some of your background, because I was really fascinated when we met and you told me about your background and your movement in different countries, your spiritual practices. I just found your life fascinating. So could you take us on a bit of a tour so we can get to know you and, and understand the the background that led to you writing this mind-blowing book? Okay. Um, yeah. I'm I'm not a spring chicken, so this means that I can look back on this life with, uh, well, with this same kind of interest that you are displaying. I'm thinking, oh yes, it has been quite a bit of a life. So I was I I was the my parents were diplomats, which and diplomats of a of a Western country, um, which means that. Every two, three years on average, well, you know, we'd, I'd be uprooted from wherever I was and taken to a different place, which was, well, traumatic. It was difficult, but I learned to adapt. And it did give me the great advantage of learning languages. And since my parents were of different nationalities, I had two and actually three because of a different country in which I started life, I've had three languages from birth, which means uh, there's you've got the background of being a natural linguist um, and being in all sorts of different cultures from a very from a very very early age, and a very important um, immersion for me was in adolescence when they were posted to Soviet Russia. So I got to be acquainted with Soviet Russia, both you know, being a foreigner and constantly being listened to and being monitored you know, by, the, by the, the KGB system, um, and yet uh, encouraged by my father to make the most of this experience, and so I actually had my first year in university with um, uh, at Moscow University with with the Russians, with you know all the people who went there. Um, so that was that was absolute. That was a gigantic uh, experience. And after that, you know, growing up, uh, I still. I couldn't settle anywhere really, so I I became a translator and interpreter. So constantly moving around, following you know wherever such events would take me, and still this was not enough. Um, I became a singer, but not a regular singer. I went into the most ancient forms of church chant to explore sound. And since I was not finding sound in the West because there were no living traditions, I um, went back to Russia and worked with Russian singers uh, of the of the let's say grassroots variety, not the not the polished singers, and that led me on to India, where I got a scholarship to study Drupad, which is the most ancient form of classical Indian music, where you have the discipline of starting your day every day at 4 a.m. 
And, you know, like a good uh, Tibetan monk digging up the deepest sounds from your belly for the first two hours of the day. And then, you know, gradually the practice would diversify. Um, and in parallel with all that, my quest for sound and my quest for I didn't know what um, turned my attention to anthropology. So I um, took a degree in medical anthropology first, for which I'm very grateful because it gave me the grounding in the medical aspect rather than the, you know, woollier so-called cultural aspects. And while I was in India studying Drupad, I was also immersed increasingly in a grassroots esoteric tradition of Bengal, which is at the most unorthodox edge of both Sufism and Tantric, let's say, Hinduism. Okay, although Hinduism is a misnomer, but I'll, you know, not talk about that now. And, um, okay, well, that's the overall introduction for the time being. But um, I should say that that tradition in which I was immersed and initiated in esoteric grassroots Bengal is uh, something that calls itself within the movement the human path. And these people adamantly professed that we have no gods, no priests, and no religions. Now, when the uh, whole COVID situation started exploding, and it was obvious that the behavior of what was running this was very priestly and came up with all sorts of mantras and things like that that felt very much like a religion, suddenly something clicked in my mind and all sorts of bits and pieces of a puzzle that had been scattered until then over the decades in my life, everything came together and I absolutely felt the urgency to explore the continuity of the religious phenomenon from what we call religion in ancient times up to what is behaving like a religion of a secular variety now. And so that's what sort of took me on this long journey from Yahweh, basically, um, all the way to where we're now with AI and all these things. And seeing that there is definitely a continuity, there is a structural continuity in terms of all the elements that make up a phenomenon of religion. And, um, uh, and it was, yeah, it was just a crazy journey. Really very compelling. I really had to write every day. It was every day, every day, every day. And going through many, many, many dark, dark black holes of that journey. Um, but coming out of it, I can say that for me, it has been more than therapeutic, to very, very liberating, and has now opened up for me a completely different um, you know, way of being at the same time thoroughly embodied as a human being and thoroughly hooked into the, you know, the world of subtle, subtle energies, nature, and all these aspects. Is that enough for an introduction, Paul? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, now, just so people know that are listening, you're a long ways away from me uh, geographically. So if you guys notice that the, the audio is fading in and out, Anna is in a little village. Anna, where exactly are you again? Well, I'm actually in Bangkok right now today. Which gives me a better, la a better, better internet. I mean, from the, my village, we would not be able to to, to do this. Um, I live in a nondescript, perfectly ordinary village in Thailand. I am. I'm married. I'm married to a local peasant, um, which means this is what I call the successful downward social mobility. Yes. One question that 
that I wrote down while you were giving the introduction, which I'm grateful for, I, I think it's fascinating, is having been in Soviet Russia, you know, a lot of what's going on in the world today is really pushing itself towards some form of communist type control. And there's all sorts of discussion of connections with potentially uh, Russia and China, and it seems to be a bit convoluted, but uh, I've seen many interviews with people uh, that were were uh, there in Nazi Germany when uh, I've seen a couple interviews, one with an old, an older, quite old lady, but she was warning that this is exactly how uh, the whole Nazi regime started. Um, and then, of course, there's been uh, I've even seen videos. I recently watched a video from a man that was in the KGB that uh, defected to the United States, explaining exactly the techniques of brainwashing that they used and do use in the KGB and how he was warning the Americans that's exactly what's going on and that they'd better wake up fast. So I'm curious, with your experience in communist Russia, what do you see as a parallel going on? Is there any? Um, well, I'd like to first, you know, say that witting, unwittingly, you know, most Westerners and especially Americans, um, even if they want to be very objective and very balanced, uh, you know, I think from the cradle, you you all have been brainwashed. Um, with this- <laughs> The, the yeah. boogeyman, no, the boogeyman of, of communism. You know, before before my family was sent to, to to Russia when I was when I was fifteen, you know, I went through, um, you know, some sort of preparation, let's say, um, by by the by the authorities on the western side. And so, when I arrived in Russia, I was fully prepared to be encountering. You know the boogeyman, and uh, I very quickly realized that I was dealing with, you know, people. And um, but there's one thing, you know, I'm uh, I'm not here to defend communism, and I'm not here to defend anything. But if you consider, and this is one of the elements that the book goes into, you know, the West has been in the grips of literally a religion of money, which we call capitalism in the West. Okay. Now, and but it is completely implicit. Now that it is imploding or exploding uh, with, you know, the Great Reset and all these agendas, people are beginning to realize that, okay, capitalism, um, especially of the variety that has been developed by its high priests, is not is not the friend of the people. Nevertheless, it is assumed that capitalism is a good thing because at least the generations that have lived after the Second World War have been able to have democracy along with capitalism. Um, But these two things are not synonymous, actually. So, you know, the first thing to understand is that all of us Westerners have a prejudice against communism. So, with you, when you look at that, and then you go back to the situation in Russia, well, the revolution was ushered in with the funding of the big bankers of the West to break up a very great country that was in turmoil anyway. Okay? So they had an opportunity to, to break it up. Now, it so happens that there was in Russia, I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole situation was imploding in Russia anyway because um, there was a huge amount of discontent amongst the little people, even though you know, the serfdom regime had been abolished some decades earlier. It was basically the first country that had abolished slavery, um, if you want to call serfdom the equivalent of slavery. And 
I mean, this is also something that I mentioned briefly in the book. You know, communism versus capitalism is not a, a, a specific, it would be a whole topic, you know, of, of its own. And, you know, I'm not a specialist in political science. However, um, one needs to understand that for all the horrors that the communist Soviet regime inflicted in the first decades of its life, which would be normal, I think, not normal in human terms, but, you know, all major upheavals of any kind of regime have always come with huge, you know, human cost. So this is not to excuse that regime. It's just an, ob an objective fact. After the war, somehow that country grew to become a superpower that could hold its own, you know, in front of the USA without all the same resources, without all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, you could not have become, you know, the other superpower starting in the, you know, the late 40s and the 50s if you were presiding over a nation of slaves. It doesn't, you know, that wouldn't work. And when I was there, I was there in the 70s, and those were the stodgiest years of, you know, the heavy bureaucratic Soviet regime. I encountered a culture of people who were, I have never met in the West people who had that degree of cultural sensitivity, creativity, um, curiosity, emotional fullness. You know, when I went back to the West after that, it took me 10 years to get used to the emotional barrenness of the West. Okay, so this is just my, you know, my personal experience from having been there at that particular time. While I was being spied on all the time, okay? So I really was the Westerner who was not in her own country, but I was encountering, a, you know, a nation of, of people who were already, to my, you know, immature mind, more human than anything I had ever experienced in the West. So that's just, you know, by way of introduction. And then if you consider that, you know, from the fall of the, of the Soviet Union, what took place was literally the rape of Russia and the rape of the different other republics of what had been the Soviet Union. Um, if you consider that basically what they were offering was a counterculture um, which inspired virtually all the newly independent countries of the third world in the 50s and 60s. Uh, I'm not saying that anything was good or bad here. I'm just saying that we've got a number of sort of basically historical facts that should put the experience of Soviet communism in perspective. Now, Chinese communism is, is a different thing. And I'm certainly not a specialist of that. However, what I know for sure is that there is no um, I don't think we need to fear a collusion of Russia and China on the on the grounds of communism. China, Russia has come out of, you know, that regime is over. And Russia has had to go through a really very hard period over the past, you know, 30 years of uh, basically, you know, jungle capitalism at the expense of the country. The cost to Russia in particular and to many of the ex-Soviet republics of um, post-Sovietism, let's say, of, well, you know, Russia opening up to the capitalist world and having economic shock therapy and, and the theft of all its major assets and, the, and, you know, the rise of its mafioso oligarchy. I mean, all these things have been deeply traumatic. The loss of lives has been phenomenal. Um, they they are now maturing into something else, which is, I think, in political and possibly and economic terms, possibly going to be a stabilizing factor for the world. 
So, you know, I think it would be urgent to start respecting the journey that Russia has been through, um, the maturing journey that it has been for Russia. Um, in between, you know, the, 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 the Western American-dominated polarity plus Europe and the Chinese polarity on the other side, I see Russia as a, you know, a third way. Um, and I think, you know, even in, in karmic or, uh, you know, the spiritual destiny of nations, I think I definitely think that Russia has, has a major role to play as a stabilizer uh, for this crazy planet. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you share your views because it's certainly not the kinds of things I was taught in the military as a soldier. Um, I have high level students and practitioners, many of them from Russia, and they uh, say things very similar to you. Uh, one of my friends uh, is a Russian Olympic uh, weightlifter and was a world champion in Russia. And it was interesting because when I was lecturing in Moscow and spent time with him, one of the things he said to me was quite interesting. He said, Paul, you guys just think you're free, but you're not free. We have a lot more freedom than you do. This is true. They have, they have conquered it inside themselves. You know, what they went through in the Soviet era. And at the same time, being in the Soviet Union gave the opportunity to all the little people, you know, the little people, the bottom of the social ladder. If you consider that in 1917, the country had 80% illiteracy. And after, wow. the second, after the Second World War, it was 100% literacy. And anybody with any kind of grain of excellence, potential, would be taken care of. They had organic food by default. I mean, you know, uh, they had health care that was, it was effective, it was efficient, it would, did not need to be high-tech, very expensive, and um, it was truly caring in a sort of graph, you know, from my, from what I saw and what I, you know, saw, you know, even recently, it's your gruff, effective grandmother taking care of you. She's not taking any bullshit from you, but she's really taking good care of you. You know, it's that kind of system. So it, you know, it, okay, it, it may be, it, it was rough around the edges, but it was good at the core. And because the people knew that there was this system of imposition, they learned, they practiced their human qualities beneath that. You know, and this is this is the reality of what built up this country, and and this country was professing the you know the ideology was about you know power to the people, so they didn't eradicate, they didn't you know quash and vampirize the people like the capitalist system does. That's a major major difference. Yeah, where where. Out of curiosity, I mean, we have a lot to get into, but I can't resist. Where do you think this whole uh, great reset pandemic thing is actually headed? Because it's, it's, I, I think it's beyond uh, communism, capitalism. I think it's, um, I think as as I'm sure you are aware, it's a handful of people trying to take over the entire planet, and it seems somehow they've cast a net that is circling the globe and it doesn't matter what country the same agenda is unfolding and i'm just curious with your life wisdom and your experience and your depth of knowledge uh, if you look into your crystal ball what do you see uh, unfolding here well i mean actually this is you know this is what what the book is about ultimately where it is going i mean this is you know people say People who are sensitive to what is really going on say it is actually a spirit. This is a battle for the you know heart and soul of humankind, and it definitely is. Okay, these it's being run by a bunch of people, um, but behind these people there is something else, and you know this something else is what puts this squarely in the spiritual field. The spiritual field being a 
a, a field of spirits. <coughs> you know, there is the, the human soul and there is the human spirit and there are spirits, good spirits and bad spirits. So, uh, you know, like others, I think there are others um, who may be more, more out, kind of woo-woo than me, but to me it is very, very clear and you know, I see this in, in my meditation also. We're dealing with some other kind of entity. And um, I firmly believe that humans, it is our calling, our mission, to deal with this, which has been a major problem for a very long time. You know, our growing into our adulthood involves growing into the fullness of who and what we really are um, so that at last this entity, this whole whatever it is, uh, can no longer feed off of us and, and, you know, destroy life because it's not just about us, it's also about our planet. We are part and parcel of this planet, even as we are part and parcel of the universe. And this is this fundamental point of this, the, the joining of these two things is absolutely crucial. It's absolutely crucial. It, it, this is a mission that we have to fulfill with and on this planet. In these embodiments of ours. Hi, everybody. I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers, which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wade, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes magnesium breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that Different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combined them without any weird excipients or you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy by Optimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it? And what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living40 and put in your coupon code Paul10 and you get a 10% discount, and of course, everything has a 100% money-back guarantee. You can't get better than that. Enjoy. You know, you can't have consciousness without a duality or a polarity. And things like north and south, east and west, up and down, in and out, male, female, good and evil, those are all essential polarities because without those, you can't be conscious of anything. So where I'm headed with this statement is that these entities that are behind all of this, which I do believe are very dark forces, uh, and I even said on my Why Kings Kill Your Children video that I put on YouTube, if, if I didn't know better, I would think we were, we were dealing with some kind of an alien force that has no respect for humanity or life but seems to be just wanting to gobble everything up like a machine that won't stop eating until somebody unplugs it. And <laughs> so the point I'm making, <laughs> the point I'm making is, is that, you know, clearly Bill Gates is involved. Fauci's involved. The whole drug systems involved. The, the, the vaccine manufacturers are now controlling governments and all of this stuff. But what I'm really driving at is, these people, no matter how we look at them or how we dark we think they are, they are also part of the earth and they are part of the universe. And I, I want to hear what you think with regard to this concept, because as I've told many people, I say, look, if you could wave a magic wand right now and get rid of these people and stop all of this, 
and we went back to business as usual, we would probably collapse nature within 10 to 20 years and have a catastrophe of far, far greater magnitude than any forced vaccinations or any of that stuff. So to me, this is the great event that has to happen to give us awareness of what we've not been paying attention to, what we've relegated to state and to deep state and to secret factions and not paying attention to what our tax dollars are doing and who's doing what and how the United States has been involved in the rape and pillage of other countries and all sorts of stuff. So I think that paradoxically, that there's a deeper movement going on and it's the opportunity for humanity to go through, like you alluded to, a, a, a trial a trial of becoming adults and taking responsibility for their choices and their actions and becoming aware that we must come back into alignment with the earth or the Hopi prophecy becomes terribly, shockingly obje objective. Uh, what's your thoughts in that regard? Uh, absolutely. Yes, um, definitely. You know, uh, we cannot go back to business as usual and we already, we've been knowing it for a long time. But business as usual, you know, we all have gone along with the business as usual that was dictated from above by the high priests of money, of science, of war. You know, we had peace movements and we had protests and things like that. We knew that it wasn't right. You know, we've been wanting to protect the environment, but we did not have the whole picture of of why it was like that. I mean, the what you what you refer to this sort of entity or whatever it is, alien force that seems to want to gobble up gobble up everything. This is only the final apotheosis, so to speak, of something that has been in preparation for, for a very long time. And, you know, why did we not react to all this in an effective way earlier? Because we have been under a spell for millennia, okay? For millennia. And this is where, you know, the deciphering of the phenomenon of organized religion is really important if we want to rid ourselves of the formatting that is deep inside our subconscious into it's deep in, in our traumatized selves intergenerationally and even i would say you know across the whole uh collective unconscious memory of humankind you know we all carry a huge amount of trauma that has brought us in the human evolution all the way to this point now in time where, you know, the method of this dark entity or these dark entities reveals itself with, you know, all the, the absurdity and the cruelty of what is being deployed now and the sheer amount of, uh, there is no other word than to say sacrifice. It's sacrifice of life sacrifice of the life of this planet and sacrifice of animal life and human life in very cruel forms um which that you know that also tells us about very dark dark things so you know we may not want at this stage to go into the detail of of all that but basically where we are at now is the culmination of something that has been in the making with the, the programming of humans, or at least the mass of humans, to produce a certain effect, okay? And this effect at this end stage of that game, what I call the long game of the gods, and I, you, I, I've borrowed this term from um, an exceptional etymologist, symbolog symbological etymologist called Pierre Sabak. He, he's deciphered, uh, you know, uh, all the religious terminology from ancient cultures and found all sorts of elements that allow him to say that there is a long game of the gods. 
And from my examination of the past 4,000 years plus, we are now reaching the culmination of the long games of the long game of the gods, where it's all coming out. And this culmination is also what I believe to be the culmination of the hidden, unknown to us, long game of humanity. We have been deprived of knowing who we are, what we are, where we really come from, what our job truly is all about on this planet. We've been cut off from nature, cut off from our planet. Um, you know, we've been, we've been soul split. Our souls have been split in so many little pieces. You know, the soul loss phenomenon that is well known in shamanism. Um, you know, we've all been victim of this. You know, now is the time for us to gather all the pieces of our souls and to truly become ourselves, what we are to be at this juncture in Earth, sort of, or in, you know, cosmic time. So, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. As regards the whole issue of polarities, yes, we live in a world of polarity, and this is, this is the, one of the elements that gives rhythmicity, rhythm. You know, the rhythm of day and night is probably the most fundamental along with the polarities of um, feminine and masculine. On the other hand, there has been a, uh, an intellectual heavy tendency to draw up classifications where you've got, you know, all the negative side is under the night the feminine, the this, that, and the other, and all the positive stuff is under the masculine. This is an artificial artifact, okay? Things are much, much more nuanced than that. Um, so uh, navigating the polarities with all their nuances is a fabulous game that we need to learn to play again, you know, with, um, with enjoyment, Rather than going into the 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 you know tidy little squares of uh, um, yeah you know all the all the different elements of the polarity put in a negative and a positive column because this this impoverishes our both our sensory ability and our emotional ability and of course our ability to think correctly. I agree. A couple of questions rise up. You mentioned there was a lot of uh, cruel sacrifice, but by definition and by historical application, sacrifice is the giving up of something for the gods. It is a return. Whenever the natives would hunt or even gather, there was a sacrifice and there were rituals that were acts of giving back. So sacrifice is a giving back. It's, it's maintaining the cycle of return. You know, Walter Russell speaks of the love principle and says that for love to be in balance, there has to be a balance between giving and receiving. And so the sacrifice is, is always about if you take an animal or you take life, then you must give life or some kind of sacrifice back but this does not look like sacrifice to me it looks like murder i'm curious what your thoughts are in that regard and and along with that you mentioned the gods uh i'd like your thoughts on who exactly are the gods what gods are you referring to because that's quite a general uh, term that can be misconstrued yeah so paul i mean this Okay, I mean, you really go. You're going. You're going for the meat of everything, um, and I'm not surprised, actually. <laughs> yeah, I've been a long, around long enough to to to, to know when uh, things are sacrificial out of spiritual uh, intent, and when um, things are sacrifices out of malevolence. 
And so when you use the word sacrifice and gods in that context, I need to get some clarity for myself and for everybody listening because, yeah, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I, 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 I don't, I, <laughs> yeah, I think you know what I mean. Yes. Okay, Paul, this is where, um, there again, yeah, I, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, most of the people listening to this are monolingual, they're English speaking, and they have probably not had much exposure to uh, ancient languages from which our modern languages are derived. And so, you know, we have been brought up to think that, you know, making sacrifices for others, for a good cause, for this, that, and the other, uh, is a good thing. And you take the example of, you know, indigenous cultures where humans have to make sacrifice to give back to, you know, nature that gives you an animal that is willing to sacrifice its life for you. Um, one needs to look at etymology, and the same applies, you know, there is the whole first section of the book is about words and the way we use a number of words without knowing where they come from. And consequently, we are misleading ourselves and we're actually feeding, feeding into the word spell that has been given to us by the high priests of the gods. So, sacrifice is basically from sacrum, Facere, to make separate. Okay, the fundamental distinction here is what is separate from the, what is called the profane, you know, that is part of the, or let's say, the ordinary world. So what is to be made separate is the sacrificial offerings that will be given to the god. Or it is the land that is to be made sacred as the place for a temple. Now, this goes back to very ancient times. And it is known uh, that in very ancient times, the forms of sacrifice to the gods of ancient Mesopotamia and to Yahweh also, as per the ancient testament, they had a particular fondness for human sacrifice of very, very young infants. Um, this has some, I mean, you know, they needed this for, I need to, don't need to go into the details why, but basically it's food for the gods. I think it's fine to go, go into the details. My podcast is, is not fluffy people. If they are subscribers to my podcast, they're truth seekers. I want to know the truth. I want to hear, uh, spare us nothing. I want to hear your wisdom. Okay, so this is, you know, I'm, I, I, you know, I have been leaning. I must be very, very clear that, you know, uh, to be able to put together the pieces of the puzzle, I've, I've been leaning on people who are deep specialists in different topics. So I've already mentioned Pierre Sabat for esoteric etymology in the, you know, God language, God languages of the past. Um, there is a, a school of dissenting thought in Italy um, based around a man called uh, Mauro uh, Bigli Biglino, who is a specialist in Hebrew. He was doing um, official translations of ancient Hebrew texts for, you know, uh, official Catholic publication. And one day, after doing that for a number of years, he started wanting to say in his translations what the texts were really saying in Hebrew. And so he came out of that closet, basically, and he started publishing books to the effect that actually the ancient testament nowhere uses the word God and uh, shows that Yahweh is basically an extraterrestrial warlord who uh, lords it over his, you know, the, the, the clan and the piece of terry that he's been allocated amongst the other Elohim who are a, 
a bunch of overlords, probably a continuation of the Anunnaki. Um, and, you know, that he requires these sacrifices. And he goes into fastidious detail. I mean, really fastidious. It's not like, you know, okay, you know, make a sacrifice to me so that I can give you my bounty. That was not it. You know, for I don't know how many decades he had his people wandering around, having all sorts of hardship, rebelling against him, betraying him because, you know, there would be another Elohim who would be nicer or less cruel than him. They were ordered to go to war constantly and to basically kill off um, cousin branches of their same um, primordial, you know, um, ethnic family. Uh, and at the same time, the newborn Newborn males aged eight days were to be given to him in sacrifice. And he gave these very, very uh, uh, fastidiously detailed specifications about the length, the height, the width of the pyre, you know, the pile of wood where these things would be burnt, the order in which things would be burnt, and... Um, and the stipulation that these offerings had to be fully burnt, which is the actual meaning of the word holo cost. Cost, burn, holo, complete, total, full, whole. So, you know, when we say holocaust today, um, that's not, you know, holocaust is the full burning of sacrificial offerings. And so, uh, so Bilino lays this out you know, black on white, in literal translations from the Hebrew, without the spiritualization that came later on. So that's an elucidation of sacrifice. And what did the gods or uh, Yahweh give in return? Oh, a lot of hardship, basically, you know, from, from that reading of the Ancient Testament. So, you know, if you take that as your starting point and you consider the trauma on the people of, well, the trauma on the newborn babes to be burnt alive at the age of, you know, eight days old, the trauma on the people to have to give up their firstborn child and to see it, okay? I mean, you know, I, I don't think we need to go into those details. In addition to the trauma of constant warring, um, and of you know having this warlord chief that they constantly needed to get away from, you know why? So you know this is this is the origin of what would later on become the Christian religion. If you look at those facts as bare facts, uh, well, sacrifice doesn't look too good, and it is a word that has later on been naturalized into our vocabulary as being a good thing that we should do, you know, for others, for the gods, for this, that, and the other, including the ultimate sacrifice of the man Jesus. So this gives you a different perspective. It would be interesting to know in indigenous languages whether what we translate as being sacrifice really means sacrifice in those languages along the same lines as what I've just described for the birth of religion. Because yeah. does our planet, is it written anywhere? Is there any religion that says that our planet requires sacrifice from us? Not that I, not that I know of. It's, it's always, as you know, it's always dictated in some form of religion. Well, there we are. Okay, you've just validated what I'm saying. So religion, a sacrifice is a major element in the phenomenon of religion. And what this also means is one has to be very careful with all the words that we use in respect of religion, spirituality, and things like that. We tend to imply that religion implies spirituality. And we tend to think that spirituality is a very good thing. 
but spirituality basically has to do with um, things beyond the mundane world, let's say. And uh, religion, because we don't have another term, we tend to project the word religion on the practices that we deem to be spiritual in other cultures. But if I just take, you know, dharma in India, we translate it as religion. But if we know a couple of things about the phenomenon of dharma uh, in Hinduism or in Buddhism, it's not the same as religion in our Western sense. Especially Buddhism, which is, you know, there is no God in Buddhism. Dharma is something to do with the correct way of life in harmony with with all, you know, with nature, society, and the cosmos. So, you know, there's there's a very, very big distance between our understanding of religion and an understanding such as dharma, which is illegitimately translated as, you know, the religion of the Hindus and the Buddhists. Likewise, I mean, there is the whole issue of the God word. Now, for that, I mean, there's, it's, it's, there's the very, very big topic of etymologies of God words, uh, God names. And, you know, I did a bit of a comparative exercise across the main languages of, of, of Christendom and in reference to uh, to the gods of uh, uh, to the god situation of India and having lived in India I lived in India for seven years um, the god phenomenon in India or the perception that people have their attitudes to their deities is not at all the same as what we have in the West or in, in monotheism it's not at all the same thing and so, you know, basically, uh, yeah, it would be necessary to unpack the etymological aspect, if that's where you want us to go now. Well, we, yes, I do want to go there. But before we go there, I still want to get the answer to a question, and that is, what is the function of the sacrifice going all the way back to Yahweh, ah, the babies, okay, and, right. and whatever, whatever? In other words, what? See, there's many people that I've studied that have said directly or implied that we are being sacrificed. That all this electronic tracking and uh, hooking people up to 5G and related practices are actually a means to extract life force energy out of human beings exactly they yeah that's right that's right that's right so what i wh why would yahweh want these kids sacrificed what is what is being released to them i mean you got a bunch of ashes so the only thing that can be released is some kind of energy so help me and everyone listening understand why the sacrifice and why and how does that relate to what's going on now Right. Okay. So with Yahweh, what is explicit, once again, in the, you know, in the literal translation by this man, Biglino, what is um, clearly stated in the Ancient Testament is that he needs this for his comfort. It gives him relief. It gives him <laughs> That's <re> sick. <laughs> it's, uh, yes. It's the smell. It's the <laughs> fragrance. It's the fragrance. Okay. Now, you know, fragrance is not just, you know, perfume. We know from the importance of, let's say, essential oils and the importance of the olfactory function for us. Uh, it's the most primitive uh, sense organ and it feeds into all the others. And it is, it is the most direct route, um, uh, subtle route. Um, across the blood-brain barrier, you know, and it impacts all the other senses. So, yes, it's the only monosynaptic nerve in the brain. Well, okay, now it's the it's the only of the cranial nerves. It only has one junction, so it, so it's a direct connection to the brain. Right. Um, 
So it's absolutely fundamental. Now, is the olfactory system of an ET warlord 4,000 years ago built the same way? I don't know. However, it is said that he needs to have these sacrifices of very young animals, lambs, and preferably human animals, for his comfort, his relief, because basically he is down here in a different atmosphere. It's uncomfortable for him to be down here amongst the humans, okay? And he's not permanently down here, but when he's down here with the humans for any, you know, for a few days or a few weeks, he needs to have his dose of whatever. I mean, this is medicine for him. It's olfactory medicine. Yes, and, and I just interject. I would just say that but what, what we're talking about here boils down to frequency. Smells, herbs, flowers, it all boils down to frequency, which is energy. Exactly, exactly, sure. Yeah, exactly. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Shervine Jaffariya, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Shilaj minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their biocharge activated coconut charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis liposomal glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. It's driving me out of my skin to have to ask you this. You're speaking of Yahweh as an entity, a being, like, like, uh, just like um, some kind of a being. I don't know what kind of a being, be it human or otherwise. I really want to hear from you. Who in the world do you think Yahweh is? I mean, we have the Old Testament, which certainly gives adequate representation that this whoever it is, whatever it is, has a very distorted sense of love and connection and is quite evil. Exactly. Absolutely. No, I mean, if you, there again, now Biglino also translates literally um, the terms that go with the angels, you know, the seraphim and all that. And he actually demonstrates that the Hebrew words show them to be Devices, they are uh, actually, they're interdimensionals that can take on a physical form, like interdimen certain interdimensionals can take a physical form for a certain length of time. It takes a certain amount of energy to do that, and then they have to pop back into their other dimension. So the seraphim and the cherubim are, uh, they're, Huh. You know, there's chariots and there's, uh, you know, the, the different devices that Yahweh uses. They are energy devices, they are transport devices, they are communication devices. So, you know, this is interpreted as angels in the Greek sense of messengers, as being the, you know, the representatives of, of Yahweh. And Yahweh comes down on his glory, they say in the Bible, but the glory is actually a kind of, flying device. So if one understands that Yahweh is some kind of more or less interdimensional extraterrestrial being as the other Elohim and as is clear from the Anunnaki previously, 
And, you know, they being different and more powerful because of their tech, more powerful than the humans who were there, could lord it over, over the humans, colonize them, and wrap this in their temple systems into systems that would probably not yet have been called religions at the time. The word religion actually comes up only with, you know, uh, uh, with, the new, with the New Testament. It's only at that moment that we start having a phenomenon that we can call religion. Uh, it, you know, in the earlier times, there were different terms to denote your relationship with entities that were not human, be they ETs, be they thought forms, be they demons, be they whatever. And, you know, in the ancient world, people were much, much more familiar than we are with our secularized, mechanized understanding of reality, they were much more familiar with entities, you know, demons. The word daimon was a very flexible word that meant anything on a spectrum from what we would call God to what we would call Satan. Along, you know, and along that spectrum, you had jinns, you had, you know, evil genies, and you had, you know, the positive daimon, you know, who is an inspiration for you. So they used that word and they had all sorts of qualifying words. And they lived with these entities exactly like indigenous peoples live with the entities of, you know, the spirits of nature simply because their senses are still attuned to them, whereas ours are completely atrophied. Not all of us. Uh, okay. Not all of us, I agree, but I mean, I'm talking on you know behalf of the vast majority of us. If Paul, if the vast majority of us had been able to remain attuned to that, we would not be in the predicament that we're in now. I agree. I'm just simply saying that I'm very aware of these things. I'm I've conducted hundreds of shamanic ceremonies and done a lot of deep exploration and come into contact with a lot of intense <laughs> experiences and studied a lot. And there's many cultures that speak very clearly. For example, I've got very good books describing that though we have all of our fascination with angels, there are the equal and the opposite counterpart, which are the, what's often referred to as the dark angels. And, and so there's these dialectics there's these forces of tension that create consciousness throughout the entire universe but pe people are too immature to look at the dark side of it so they keep on you know fantasizing that everything's gaga goo goo in re religion land but it's a bit immature and sorry to interrupt you can't blame they've been we've been programmed to believe that way and we've been programmed well, i understand that well we've been programmed to uh, be sinners who must depend on um, being saved by, you know, uh, the Savior on the cross. And, you know, that's a never-ending sacrifice, okay? And now to be saved by AI, by strange things being put in our bodies and, uh, you know, whatever. But we are constantly, you know, we've been infantilized. That's, that's the real issue. Yes. But at the same time, I have to to say and uh you know that i'm a human being just like you are and you and i both got smart enough to start saying something does not work here something's not right i have to i can't get answers to the questions from the people that should be answering them and i've made it my life's mission to get those questions answered no matter whether i have to sit in meditation for hours on end do shamanic ceremonies or travel the world looking through libraries and I think uh, we're at a point now where, where people cannot just sit around and play this game. Somebody else is going to take care of me. And just because the book said so, it must be true because that's shallow. My, my, my five-year-old boy's got a deeper sense of curiosity than that. Right. Yeah. But Paul, I mean, the reason why you and me too have embarked on these journeys um, comes from You've described uh, your very, very difficult childhood, to put it, to use an understatement. 
And I can say, yeah. <laughs> you know, I've had my version of something like that. Um, and there has been something about us, about people like you and me, and there are many others like you and me, although they're not the majority, unfortunately, who have also been born with or felt compelled to find their way out of the trauma imprinting that you know we've been subjected to and to understand why our parents or our societies or whatever do these things to us okay so i mean you know you have just said how wide and far and deep you've had to go i can say the same in the in a very different way but we reach the same point we reach the same point where you know we see what is going on and we lament the fact that everybody else is still sleeping they're sleeping because there is the trauma programming that is in this collective subconscious of the whole of humankind, and we need to cure the trauma. You and I have had to face, to digest the trauma to which we've been subjected, right? To be able to alchemize it and to recover the energy that was blocked in it. And that is the energy. We go back to your question about sacrifice. By traumatizing us, through different means, okay? Under Yahweh, it was very violent. It became somewhat softer after the New Testament with the Jesus variation, although they came out with the Inquisition and they did all the, you know, they did different types of brainwashing and, uh, and, and formatting of the population to keep getting people to sacrifice in different other ways to the Godhead and, you know, f feeding the high priests and then this became secularized, you have exactly the same phenomenon carrying on with the religion, the, the religion of God. The, sorry, the God of, of money. And now the religion of science. And now the God of science. And, okay, and it comes all the way back. You know, you look at the way science needs sacrificial animals that it uh, dissects, and we've got the latest, you know, revelation about uh, Fauci's puppies and all that, and the monkeys. And, you know, it's coming out in the open. But this has been going on for the past 4,000 years at least. And so this has been intergenerational, perpetual trauma imprinting so that we remain dissociated from ourselves, so that we remain in fear, so that we need to depend on the Savior, and so that with the fear that we're constantly exuding, they can extract with, you know, this or that extra practice, they can extract energy. You were absolutely right. Yahweh was deriving, you know, comfort from a fragrance. Um, uh, the gods derive great enjoyment from the energy of suffering. Um, and it's... <sighs> the energy of human suffering, the energy of human emotions. And they they know that our emotions are powerful. They do not have these emotions. They do not have the spectrum of emotions that we have. And basically, they need to keep us in fear and to harvest the emotions and the substances, okay? Um, you know, the body fluids that are harvested from sacrificial victims. Uh, all these things... Yeah, blood. Apart and adrenochrome, I mean, all these things are part of the same continuum. If you look at that element, just the element of sacrifice, understanding what it is from the point of view of the gods, and not from the point of view of our erroneous translation of other cultures' understanding of giving and taking. Sacrifice is a major indicator uh, yeah, you know, it's it's not just from religious documents. I've studied shamanism and and native history and uh, tribes and all aspects of it. And 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 sacrifice in ancient cultures and tribal cultures was had nothing to do with uh, the Bible or standard religion. It had to do with an awareness that there's a balance in nature that has to be maintained. And you know, that leads me to ask you this question. We're talking a lot about very negative gods, but by definition, if 
the source of the universe is a zero force, which I have lots of reasons to believe it is, then for every negative God, there has to be positive gods. And for every negative extraterrestrial entity, such as a Yahweh, there has to be an equal and an opposite. And so my question for you is, how do you feel and where do you feel those positive elements play in? Because I've studied Dr. Street, Stephen Greer's work on extraterrestrials, and I believe he is the most authentic and has got by far the most experience of contact. And he has said unequivocally that people's perceptions of the extraterrestrials as negative is, is a manufactured concept to inspire uh, the military industrial complex to keep tri tricking people out of their money and keep them in fear. But the reality of it is that his contact with extraterrestrials has been incredibly supportive and they are aware of what's going on and they are watching and they have disabled nuclear weapons and all sorts of stuff to keep us alive. So where, where do you see this, this dynamic play because if you study the Sumerian tablets, you go as back as human records go, there's evidence of wars amongst the gods and, and that the, the great flood was a result of one of those wars. And there's arguing and battling amongst the gods about what human beings should be allowed to do, be taught, etc. So there's another side of the, 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 the story here. I'd like to hear your expression of the positive side of it so that we can get this thing in balance um let me i've been i've listened to quite a lot of uh, of uh, dr greer's work have you ever heard him call those all those benevolent contact entities uh, that he's encountered does he ever call them gods I don't think he's ever called them gods. He speaks to them as as beings. Uh, he speaks of them as far more intelligent than us. Exactly. Um, there's a problem with the world, with the word gods and God. Um, uh, so that's you know that's a, that's the whole chapter on etymologies. Uh, when indigenous people interviewed by Westerners refer to, they don't refer to gods, they refer to spirits mainly. They deal with spirits. And there is the great, okay, there is the great spirit, but they don't refer, the word God may be applied to them by the ethnologist who is describing their re religion, although it doesn't operate like a monotheistic or a God theistic it's not a theistic, re their religions are not theistic, okay? They're not based on gods. Uh, and our, I mean, our natural relationship with our planet is not a relationship with a, 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 a godhead. It's the concept of gods that is a problem. Out there, you know, out there in the interdimensional world, there is a, you know, teeming universe of all sorts of entities that are neutral or benevolent or, you know, there again, we have to be careful about projecting our moral understandings of good and evil on, you know, the world, the universe out there, the cosmos out there. Um, I, I think that, you know, the universe seeks constant evolution and this means that in evolution, you know, the, the game of, of polarities will lead to a certain imbalance that has to be brought back into balance. So there is this constant game, which is another form of, you know, cyclical rhythm uh, in the universe. And that is not, if, if, if the universe, the universe doesn't have a moral code that says that this is good or bad. It's a matter of, of balance. You know, we grow a little bit. We have some growing pains. And then it's going to calm down and we're going to be able to do something more beautiful. And then we have to, you know, break a leg or the universe has to have some kind of whatever, something, some, some, some big event happening out there. And then, you know, the chips will fall where they need to fall and something more beautiful will be generated on that basis. But it's not, it's not, it's not in moral categories. Now, what, uh, 
what is happening on Earth now is uh, is something that all those you know those benevolent and or neutral entities out there are watching, and uh, from what I understand, there is a lot of concern that any major uh, I mean, the destruction of planet Earth or any major transformation of planet Earth would have very deleterious ripples across the galaxy, if not beyond, in terms of that balance, okay? And this, you know, okay, so this brings us to another dimension, which is, what is Earth? And, you know, I would want at some later stage to talk probably much more about that because Earth is a being. Um, okay? And another thing, you know, that the gods have done has been to divorce us from our natural planet to make us fear, you know, her wild aspects all the way down to her my, most minute little most minute little microorganisms and uh, you know all, all the way to now declaring that nature herself is the bioterrorist you know par excellence because life is dangerous but basically the gods they need sacrifice uh, to because they they feed on real life true life, the energy, the subtle energies of life, be they embodied in blood and uh, other body secretions, or they, you know, the, the whatever energy is emanated by torturing a person, the pain of that person, and the, and the moment of their death. And there's all sorts of, you know, esoteric stuff behind that, that well, you know, I'm glad not to know, but there are all sorts of esoteric dimensions. They know what they're getting in terms of, you know, energy, energy boosts from sacrificing humans. As regards the issue of the God word, okay, it is very strange that the God word in English, as in German, Gott, is etymologically completely obscure. You know, I, I, I've checked you know, etymological, I've done et etymological searches. Expert etymologists are baffled by, you know, where does this come from? And um, it sta this stands completely separate from the origins of the God word in the Romance languages. You know, it's Deo, Dio, Deus in all the Roman languages. And that comes from a root that has to do with light, which you also find in the Indian gods. Dev, you know, in the uh, as a suffix. It's not a name of gods. It's a suffix. It's an attribute of certain beings that they're called dev, as shining. This is a very important clue. Um, it's it goes back further to the different. Uh, to the ancient etymologies in Indo-European for uh, Zeus, Zeus, Deus, Theos, these are all on, a, on an etymological continuum. But what is very, very interesting that Pierre Sebac, the esoteric etymologist, has pinpointed is that there are esoteric puns in the ancient language of the priestly lang of, of the priestly lineages, whereby Deus in Latin, Theos in Greek, goes together with Deos in Greek, which means fright, and it goes together with Phos, which in Greek means light. There is, according to his esoteric etymological research. There is a kind of esoteric phonological punning which brings all these notions together. 
And the same applies with the word Yahweh, which is esoterically punning with the ancient Hebrew word for fright, which is Yare. Well, in in uh, in a very good book I've studied, When God Was a Woman by Merlin Stone, she says the word Yahweh means ever flowing, and that she cites passage after passage in the Bible referring to God as a mountain or a volcano where people went to meet Yahweh, signifying that there was some kind of consciousness or presence there that they deified as Yahweh or God, but it was always connected to burning mountains or volcanic activity, and that the word Yahweh actually means ever-flowing. You know, I don't know what her sources are. Um, She wrote that book at least 20 years ago, I think. Yeah, it's it's an older book for sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... uh, I, I'm also feeling into my own inner sense of language and of the power, you know, there is the, the, the sound power of words. What Sabak says to me makes a lot of sense, a lot of intuitive sense. I mean, you know, anybody may be wrong, but if you consider that Yahweh was demanding all this infant sacrifice, and that he was coming down on his cherubims and seraphims that were ET vehicles that would burn people. They would kill people, um, you know, instantaneously. You know, they, he would, the, his, few, his uh, sacrificial pyres would be lit up by s- some part of the device on which he was sitting, his so-called glory, this would immediately ignite the pyre. So, I mean, Yahweh, as an extraterrestrial warlord, had pyrotechnic, uh, you know, technological prowess. You know, this may be what is expressed by this constant flowing, you know, uh, burning stuff. And his passion for, you know, burning. Stuff had to be fully burnt, okay? So, you know, I don't think at the time when um, when uh, that book was written, the stone book was written, I'm not sure there had been this much. There's been a hell of a lot of research and very critical research in the 21st century precisely because there's been <coughs> more people waking up to their own suspicions and doing deep, deep, deep research. You know, I see her book as Thank a, God. <laughs> I see, yeah, I see her book as one of the pioneering ones, opening up the way, okay? Um, and, you know, uh, so we stand, we, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, but those giants will not hold it against us if we take the arguments further and deeper. Hi, everybody. You know, people from around the world are constantly asking me where they can find organic foods and supplements that are actually organic, not just some fake impersonation, which is sadly so common in the marketplace today. My most common suggestion is go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, where you can find a wide range of excellent nutritious products made from certified organic source materials. Organifi has superfood drinks that actually taste great, (laughs) unlike most, immune support products, excellent high-quality protein powders, digestive support, joint support, liver support, green juice, hormonal support, and menstrual ease nutrition formulated by a team of female herbologists for women and more. My family and I and a significant number of my clients and friends and students from around the world use and love Organifi products because they're nutritious, taste great, And unlike many products, you actually get what you pay for. Hallelujah. I love Organifi's high values and high quality products, and they're excellent for athletes, children, and the whole family. There's no better investment than investing in your own health and well-being. And when it comes to investing in my health and the health of my family, I go to Organifi. If that's not enough to make you want to explore all the amazing products waiting for you at Organifi, I'd love to sweeten the deal for you by offering you a special Living 4D with Paul Check discount of 20% on any of Organifi's excellent certified organic, super clean, nutritious products by using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20 on checkout. That's 
CHECK20, all caps, on checkout. I hope you enjoy Organifi as much as my family and I do. No, I have another question, which is, I think, an important one in this context, because you spoke about light. The, paradoxically, light is associated with the gods, but the word Lucifer means light bearer. So I'd love to hear how you weigh in on Lucifer as light bearer. Well, Lucifer is interpreted uh, you know, as, okay, it, it is the light bearer. It is uh, Venus um, in astrotheological terms. Uh, it is deemed to be the fallen angel equated erroneously with the figure that was later invented that was Satan. Um, but if, we, if, if I take us back into the light connotations of the, you know, Deus, Dieu in French, Dio in, in Italian, you know, these words are applied, they start to be applied to gods in, um, in you know, ancient, in antiquity, in ancient Greek, Greece and Rome, and especially uh, to the Christian god, the post-Yahweh god. God, somehow Yahweh disappears and becomes god, right? Dieu. Dio Deus. Now, what I looked at was what kind of light, I mean, these are all, it's, this is a very complex topic, so, you know, bear with me. I love it. Okay, Jesus in the New Testament encodes astrotheologically the path of the sun across the zodiac and, and through the seasons. In other words, he is treated as a sun god, okay? And there is then, okay, you've got the esoteric aspect of the sun dying for three days at the winter solstice. So that's one level of coding. The death and resurrection. Right. These are, this is, it's a coding. It's an interpretation in relation to the sun. The different sun gods, uh, Zeus, Deus, Deus, these words come from the ancient Indo-European of Diaus Pita, Pita, Father, Diaus, Sky, Sky God. So Sky God would be, okay, you know, an entity that gives the light portion of the sky during the daytime, a.k.a. the sun. However, these gods, are they the sun itself? No, none of them are the sun itself. And this is, this is the subtle thing that we need to capture. I am not aware of any indigenous cultures that worship the sun, our star, in the same kind of way as the gods that are derivative of the sun and whose offspring on earth will be sun kings, such as the Egyptian pharaoh, the sons of the sun. Okay? They're, these are all derivative from the actual planet. But if you are dealing with the, uh, sorry, um, uh, star in our sky, when you are dealing as a human being with the sun in the sky, you have a natural relationship to it. You know, you are going to go out in the early morning sun to soak in the infrareds because it's bloody good for your health. And it's also the best time to do your, you know, morning work or meditations or whatever it is. And you're going to be following, you know, the behavior of the sun through the day and through the cycle of the seasons in relation to your work and in relation with the moon, basically. You know, this is what the, the bulk of humankind will have dealt with. The bulk of humankind didn't worry so much about, ooh, the sun is in Scorpio. Ooh, you know, they did not go that far. They were basically concerned with their day-to-day -day dealings with the sun being a familiar, extraordinary entity out there, a life-giving entity, um, but not necessarily deified. 
It's with organized religion, temple religion, structured priesthoods, that it becomes a good idea to codify our natural star into a derivative sun god. Do you get me? Yep. So that's that's who Jesus is portrayed as. Uh, J- Jordan Maxwell's work goes very deep into yes, all of this. Yes, and- absolutely. Yes, very much so. And so, I mean, you know, it's it's clear that you know we're dealing, we are inheriting the religious, you know, the religious religious thing, not secular religious yet. We're not there yet. But in the sec in the religious religious thing, where we have all sorts of gods or God with a capital G. In in uh, in Western Christendom, we're dealing with an entity that is a derivative from the natural sun. Okay, which and this ties in with um, the persecution of pagan, uh, let's say, spirituality rather than religion that had to do with the forces of nature and did not need to have, you know, a temple worship for the natural sun. They were attuned and in tune with the polarities of night, night and day. Um, You know, with it, it was an organic totality, both in the physical and in the subtle realm. And when you have organized religion that needs you to sacrifice to a derivative sun god who is thus a fake, a falsified sun god, you uh, you need to separate people. You need to break their natural relationship with their natural world and their natural star. And this is part of the the whole programming to keep them afraid and and. Therefore, uh, easy to manipulate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, people are afraid of the bloody sun. They're afraid of catching skin cancer. Whereas, you know, we all need that we need sun to make the vitamin D. I mean, it's so basic. But and here out in the east, well, look at the whole COVID thing. I mean, the first yes. thing they did was try to get people indoors and wearing masks. Absolutely. It was just the biggest pile of horse shit I've ever seen in my life. I spent my entire life in the field of holistic health. And I'm watching this come out. And I said to Angie and Penny, the day this went down, I said, this is the biggest hoax to ever hit humankind. What we're about to go into is is a very, very dangerous manipulation of truth because everything that's being said and done goes completely against common sense and against the psychology of what it takes to be a healthy person. And against the natural... It again. It goes against the natural human, you know, the natural human, and with, against nature. The natural human being part of nature. I mean, the whole thing. So, and but what you are seeing happening now in a magnified way has been there for a long time. Simply, a lot of it was esoterically hidden. It was occult. It was hidden from you know the understanding of the masses. Now it's all coming out in the open. And so, you know, those of us who have been in the right kind of practices for the past few years or decades are more able to decipher the deception. But this deception is nothing new, Paul. It's been going on for millennia. We have been conditioned to reach this point, which is why. And that conditioning has been so effective that there is a huge majority of people who are falling for it. And who are questioning us, (laughs) challenging us, because, you know, we are endangering their belief system, whereas ours is not a belief system. No, ours is is the product of observation and experience versus belief. I mean, that's exactly it. And this is and, and Paul, this brings us right back to another major religion between another difference between. Um, uh, institutional religions, be they religious or secular, and traditions of indigenous people and things like that, Um, there is an organic connection with your your world, with with nature around you. 
you have an organic connection and an organic sense of self versus a completely distorted um, you know sense of self where you know most of people under uh, under Christendom are ahead wandering a, f- a great distance away from its body yep amen to that so you know it's all in the head whereas in indigenous and traditional cultures the heart is you know the the sort of uh, grand central for the whole thing and you know my heart relates with joy i'm seeing the sun rising right now it's fabulous and you know my heart rejoices every day and i don't need to go down on all fours and worship this you know this is my friend mine too right so it, 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 when they have sun gods and that these sun gods you know they wage all sorts of interesting wars through their human proxies and they do all sorts of horrible stuff um it's very i, I know that you're into remote viewing um I've started training and then and then you know I got I got into writing the book so I haven't gone very far but the work of the Farsight Institute is very clear about the cruelty I mean the viciousness of such gods as Ra and uh, and Zeus so you know we have to be very 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 careful in using the word god the word religion I mean, I don't relate, uh, you know, you're a very spiritually um, filled person and I consider myself to be, you know, very much attuned or seeking to be ever more attuned to the subtle realms and to the, the, the other invisible realities of who we are in our place in the universe. And there's just no way that the God concept can 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 work in in that sphere, and there is a major problem for us that we use the same word for the cruel gods of antiquity, for Yahweh, for the you know different entities that populate the supernatural world of other cultures, and they may not use the equivalent term. They may not have a word that means God, but we don't have any other word than God that we thus impose on our understanding of them. And they must then, when they speak English back to us, they have to use the same term, even though it does not mean the same thing as as what they are actually believing in. So, uh, you know, and then when people now refer to what you call source, or, I mean, I call it the unnameable. Uh, I don't have a name for it, and I don't feel qualified to think of of a name for it. Um, but we I know, call it zero. Yeah, okay, you call it zero, but you know we can all have our private name for this entity, for this whatever it is. But please, not God, because then you know we are still we're playing in the word spell of the high priests, because the energy that we give and that we interchange with what you call zero or I call the unnameable is automatically through the use of the word God and the power of words, some of that energy is automatically going to their own gods. Do you understand? Yeah, that's a great tip. Yeah, I sure do. I thank you so much. You know, I, you know, I think you know enough about me to know I've been, I've been trying to warn people about all this religious silliness and fanaticism for a long, long time. And uh, I in the beginning of my book, I in in the there's a chapter where I completely make the distinction between what I call God with capital G, capital O, capital D, which is the functional equivalent of zero, that which cannot be known, named, or conceptualized, the or the Tao that can't be spoken, and then God with a capital G, I say is the highest power in any belief system. And then a little G-O-D is, I define as any entity with the power to change its environment. Right. Okay. But the problem is with G, G with a capital G, you're still using the same God word with the capital letter as monotheistic religion. It becomes very personal 
for you. And, you know, if we are trying to liberate the minds of others, we need to be very specific. And there's another aspect uh, that, you know, most solely English speakers or people who speak only Western languages don't realize. The other languages of the world, most of them have no difference between capital, uh, between, uh, you know, upper, what's it called, uppercase and lowercase. There is no distinction, okay? So, you know, when we have that distinction, it's strictly a Western concept and construct. Well, I got to work here because this is where people are the most lost in my observation. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, this is where... uh, you know, being acquainted with not only different languages, but also the way different people inhabit their world and their uh, belief system and their spirituality, spirituality being another fraught word. I mean, they're all fraught. All these words are extremely dangerous. So, uh, you know, in my book, I spend the first many pages, you know, going through that issue and pointing out the words that are problematic and that we tend to take for granted, especially when the more spiritual we are, um, the more we tend to discuss these things without, without the degree of care that our spiritual concern should elicit. So, you know... That's the unconscious enactment. Well, yeah, and I mean, there again, when we're educated in one language that has been a major, especially English, English being the major, a major vehicle for Christendom, and then a major vehicle for the religion of the money god, and now the super vehicle for the religion of science, English has, I mean, the power of English in terms of spellcraft is gigantic. And uh, those who use English for spiritual purposes and to, you know, help people see clearly through the fog and the deceit and the layers of obfuscation, you know, it behooves us to be very, very careful with the, with the, the words we use and how we use them. So, yeah, it, it really is, you know. Yeah. You know, you've got people, and you've got these contradictions, they're blatant now. Look at the number of alternative critical voices that are finding that science is operating like a religion, that uh, the, uh, you know, the big capitalist people are operating like a religion. And they talk about, you know, the Pope of vaccines, the high priests of, um, of medical research. They're using all these religious this religious terminology, because there is the cognitive dissonance that, you know, how can money and science be behaving like religions? Well, the short answer is they are religious. They operate like religions because they're structured like religions and they use all the same ingredients as religious religion. And then you've got people who say, oh, I have no religion, but I'm a religious person. How can you live with that stated cognitive dissonance? You can't be clear with yourself. Yeah, no, it it sets up uh, chaos inside of a person. And um, yeah, I, I do address these issues myself, and uh, I will share them with you as I pass you chapters of my book to show you how I've address them and i'd love to have your feedback i know we're on the same page paul i'm just bringing into sharper focus yeah well i love it and and i think it's critical that's why i wanted to have you here the blind spots that people who that basically people who speak only english will obviously have because they're not aware that they are using a vehicle of word spell you know, the programming, okay, and it's been going on for millennia. So just becoming aware of it and to start becoming careful with the words that one uses, especially in matters relating to, you know, soul, spirit, and these things, um, it's it's really important. Yes. And uh, all of this, 
amazing information and insights, which I find particularly important coming from you, uh, because you're a very experienced woman with a lot of uh, time in not only research, but but living with the different cultures, which we're going to get into in a minute. But uh, what what has come up with me listening to your sharing is a couple of questions. Um, one, there's a, a, a number of people from Greg Braden to Bruce Lipton to uh, uh, what's his name? I'm brain farting. Uh, uh, he does a lot of work on the Knights Templars. I interviewed him. Um, but anyhow, there's a lot of people that talk about the fact that there is a, uh, there, there's no way you can account for what human beings are in the DNA record because there's a, a significant jump in the gap between yeah. 200,000 years, 200, years ago. And so there's a lot of talk about us being genetically modified by extraterrestrials and things like that. So my question for you is two, two prong. One, if they have the technology to travel interdimensionally and, and use chariots that uh, natives saw as flaming that could kill you on contact. And as um, Stephen Greer says, the, they're in many cases, they're at least a billion years ahead of us in their technology. So it brings up two questions for me that I want to hear your thoughts on. One, that everything you've said could imply, based on what some of these other researchers are saying, that the the human race was created specifically for these sacrificial exercises. And B, my other question, which you can dovetail into your answer is, if they have that much technology, then why do they have to keep coming to Earth? Why not create whatever they need, just like Bill Gates is uh, creating genetically modified foods or they're using, um, uh, they're, they're creating, um, they're uh, using gene gene um, modification to create, like they created a sheep, and they they can create. You know, there's all, all sorts of research showing that they're creating all sorts of things, and many of them being done in top secret. You know, so my my question is, what is what is your thoughts on the origins of the human species, the the gap in the genetics, and if these people, ha these beings have this much technology, then why do they have to keep messing with us? I think I'll start with the second question because I think the first one derives from the second, actually. Um, why would they need to constantly be messing with us? Why do they need to come to this planet? Well, there's a very interesting clue in the old Gnostic uh, stories from the uh, Nag Hammadi uh, documents that talks about the origin of our planet that they call Sophia. And they talk Wisdom. about, yeah, they talk about the origin of this planet being an eon, uh, which is not the same as the word eon for a length of time, an eon is one of those high super interdimensional beings, you know, in the, let's say the first layer of differentiation of what you call zero, those beings at that level are the originators, creators of, well, you know, stars, galaxies, star systems, whatever. And this particular one, and they are somewhat gendered. You know, in that Gnostic myth, it is already clear that the eon that they call Sophia is a feminine one. And she has a project with a male eon out there, you know, to create because they have creative capability, something. And she gets so enamored with her idea 
that she pops out of that dimension and goes crashing through all the dimensions and lands here in this corner of this galaxy and starts materializing. Um, there is the sense that in her enthusiasm, she, she didn't do it in full partnership with her masculine counterpart. So he had to come up later on in some other fashion to try and fix things because it was a big mess. Um, okay, I'm doing a caricature of the story, but you get the gist. Now, there is another myth that we get from uh, Indian mythology, which is the myth of the Mahapurusha. Purusha means human being, and it is, in, it is basically in ordinary language translated to mean man, male. Now, this Mahapurusha produced some kind of mega self-sacrifice. This is, once again, the translation that I would dispute. It got really creative and generated out of itself many, many pieces that became all sorts of life forms. In particular, the human being, life form. So she tumbles out and she, you know, she, she's come down, you know, through the dimensions and she starts materializing out here in our corner of the galaxy. But she, uh, in her enthusiasm, forgot either to bring her male counterpart with her or to finalize something with him. She is lacking something of the masculine element. And this is where ancient myths both in India and in, and, in, and in Greece, come up with a great human being out there as uh, the partner for the experience that the Sophia being is planning to have in the universe. And it is to be something very unique, where we've got a feminine uh, planet that will over time develop the greatest biodiversity, the greatest uh, flourishing of life um, in partnership with humans derived from this kind of, let's say, spiritual prototype out there, you know, amongst the primordial beings. So, you know, this is a very interesting perspective to, uh, for us to have in mind in terms of who we are, okay? Now, uh, as regards the DNA sort of tampering or the creation of humans and things like that, if we take that myth as a starting point, well, the human being originates from a great interdimensional being that decides with another interdimensional being of a feminine nature to incarnate for a particular type of adventure that is unique in the universe. And from what I understand, um, mainly from ancient Russia, there is an understanding that in earlier times, humans were much more powerful. Um, but I'm not going to speak in terms of technology. I'm going to speak more in terms of all their subtle senses. They were still much more interdimensional than we are now. And they co-created the biodiversity of this planet along with Mother Earth. And this was so beautiful, it was so fantastic. Eventually, it needed, you know, the adventure needed some spice. And at the same time, in parallel, there have been other beings, which we would view as being malevolent from our, you know, earthbound moral principles, who are devourers of planetary systems, who are, dev they need to vampirize 
the energy of other planets and, and, and solar systems. And they came, you know, into these, this neck of the cosmic woods and they set their sights on planet Earth. And uh, so all sorts of stuff happened. Um, you know, there have been, I don't know, interplanetary wars, the wars of the gods and all those things. And of course, we've been visited by, you know, like, like you know, all sorts of, of denizens of other universes and solar systems. Um, you know, that, that I, I, don't see, I don't see how that could be disputed in the same way as I imagine ancient humans, when they were more interdimensional, could also, you know, bilocate and time travel and go other places and come back, right back here. Uh, it seems to me to be quite normal. But the interesting thing is that amongst the visitors here, there have been colonizers. And those that we know the best from the historical record are the Anunnaki. So, you know, if the Anunnaki are anything to go by, um, we can extrapolate further back into the past that similar things happened before. And you've got the work of... Oh, the name is going to escape me right now. Um, the people who wrote Exogenesis, Fenton's, Bruce and Daniela Fenton, you know, they have a, another story of extraterrestrial um, admixture uh, to the human DNA 800,000 years ago in Australia. So, you know, there are different stories at different times, different parts of the planet, and I think none of them should be discounted. Uh, the possibility that somebody did something to that particular chromosome that uh, that Greg Braden talks about 200,000 years ago, it makes sense, you know, in terms of a, a rapid a rapid jump in uh, in in our sort of brain capability. Uh, and then you know the Bible talks about. Yahweh doing his own thing uh, with Adam. It says Yahweh took a minute particle of himself and put it into the Adam. So he didn't create man in his image. He put a little piece of what could be construed as DNA. So, you know, this planet has been not, you know, developing its adventure with humans and all the other creatures in isolation from the cosmos. It has had contributions, uh, be they, let's say, benevolent or malevolent in the case of those who wanted us to be adapted as a slave race. Um, what, in, the, in view of all that, one has to, the question one has to ask is, what the pre-existing humans really were that were tampered with, whose DNA was modified by these visitors or colonizers? Was it really, you know, lower, uh, lower evolved humanoids? Or was it something else? Um, you know, that, that's a big mystery, and I think we need a lot of remote viewing and we need a lot of time traveling to go back and sense into what the actual history of that is. I suspect, I suspect that um, there's been a lot of devolution, you know, when there have been episodes of cruel colonization by invaders. And this has been part of the evolutionary um, path and adventure of both our planet and us together. So, does that kind of answer your questions? Yeah, I, I, I think it's very good. It's very interesting. I'm sure most of you are aware, even though you may not like the taste of organs, that organ meats are extremely important and good for you. And I've got great news for you. Paleo Valley makes an amazing grass-fed organ complex that's unique and better than anything I've ever found out there. So much better, I wanted you to hear right from Autumn Smith, its creator, exactly 
what you're going to get from their grass-fed organ complex. Autumn, get us informed on why we should be using your amazing organ complex. Okay. Well, like you said, organ meats are nature's multivitamins. And when we use them, we feel this energy and this stamina. And most people don't like the flavor. So what we did was we took grass-fed and finished organs like liver and heart and kidney, and we just put them into capsules so that you can get all the benefits, the beautiful benefits of organ meats without actually having to taste them, without liver burps, of course. And they're just freeze-dried. So again, they're not processed heavily in any way whatsoever, and they are sourced from American farmers using regenerative agricultural practices. And all you have to do to try it out is go to our website at paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, and that's lowercase c-h-e-k-15. And I sincerely hope you love it. I want to share an experience I've had on multiple occasions, which I haven't really talked about in the open before, but I'm going to today. I've had multiple experiences where I was deep into altered states, and these were night ceremonies. and. I felt the presence of a lot of beings watching, not necessarily watching me, but watching the earth. And using my clairvoyance, I looked up at the sky and I I, I call them the beings of the stars or star beings. And I literally saw an infinite number of beings, massive, massive beings that had stars within their bodies, but it looked to me like Somehow they were um, beings made of the stars or that the stars were incorporated into their beings. And what it looked like to me was that they were watching us like we watch television. And <laughs> yeah. it, it was very profound. And I've had it happen multiple times. And um, I talked to my soul and said, you know, who are these people and who are these beings? And they, my soul basically said they are beings of the universe. <laughs> you, 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 uh, don't forget you're not alone here. And, and everybody out there who's more evolved is watching the earth because it's like the way you watch football or reality TV. They love watching what's going on on earth. And many of them have already lived many lifetimes here. They've evolved out of this dimension. So they love watching to see how it's going. And, and, you know, basically just like we watch the plot of a movie, they're very enthralled with it. But I must also say that there was times where I had quite an upwelling of fear come through me because some of them uh, had the feeling that they wanted to consume us. Others seem more just like they were watching the show, and and you know I've I've done hundreds of these journeys, and so this these particular ones were quite shocking to me because having been in the presence of dark entities before, where I really had to use my shamanic abilities to protect myself and ask spirit guides to help me and protect me, so that I could make it through these dimensions without some kind of psychic damage or, or other damage. But I, I had this very profound feeling that, that there are not just beings that are watching, but there are beings that are like hungry for, you know, hungry, just like you talk about sacrifices, death, destruction. So anyhow, I just wanted to share that with you because those, those experiences are, very profound and and they're not things that I normally talk about because most people don't have the um depth to understand it and then people they think people like me are crazy without re- realizing uh I'm not crazy at all I'm an extremely rational man but I'm also a pioneer I'm I'm somebody who has deep interest in what's really going on and to find these things out you have to go into uncharted territory yeah 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 no I mean you know you that that you really have an exceptional combination there and um you, you know and it's probably for that reason that i'm that you're having me talking to you 
uh, I don't have, you know, those clairvoyance, those abilities that you have, but I'm, I'm a trained uh, past life regression therapist and I go into past lives of mine. And so I can at this point share also something that I've never spoken about to anyone and I can only mention a small part of it, but there is a being that came to me uh, just before I started, not long before I started writing the book. And it was there every day. And it was an ancient sage, a very ancient sage, very, very, very from, you know, before our historical time. Um, and one day it, into me and said, uh, okay, you know, might as well get ready, get used to this. I am you. And has given me glimpses of precisely a time when there was total harmony in this partnership between humans and Earth in a, a truly co creative adventure. Now, this has to be, you know, I've been able to put this together with. Something that I learned from my esoteric grassroots people in India who told me that the gods envy us humans. And you put that together with the extraordinary biodiversity and creativity of our planet. It's clear that the gods, I mean, those, those, those sort of frightening entities that you saw out there that wanted to devour you or us, um, yes, yes, the, the, this is something that we need. Yeah, there's another piece of, of um, deceitful propaganda, you know, that is being fed to us that, yeah, we're just in this insignificant planet in a, you know, remote, remote sort of completely forgotten sort of dead end of the, uh, of the galaxy. And human beings are, you know, we're just, you know, tiny piddling little nothings. Well, it seems that no, actually, you know, this experiment of Earth with humans is exceptional in the universe, and that indeed it, it is being watched by the universe, uh, that there are high, high stakes, not only for us, but for everybody else in how this thing turns out. And so, you know, when you look at it, if you look at it from that perspective, History makes sense. What we're going through makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, it does. It's, you know, what, it, what the, the vision that comes to me is that the Roman gladiator games are a reenactment of this bigger show. Yeah. There have been different sort of, you know, uh, stagings of, of the particular thing, except now, now it's the whole planetary population and it's the whole of life. And there's another thing. When I talked about the myth of the Gnostics, you know, with the Aeon Sophia who decided to incarnate. So this Aeon Sophia is the real reality of this world. And the jealous entities out there are what the Gnostics call the Demiurge with his, you know, crew of archons. And I'm sure, you know, nearly everybody who listens to this is familiar with, with the term, you know, archons. And they are characterized by the inability to be creative. The gods are not creative. They are expert simulators, deceivers. They are phenomenally intelligent in terms of devising tricks to deceive and to simulate. Now, look where we're going. We're going into virtual reality simulated worlds okay it's all out in the revelation of the method you know as michael hoffman says it's in your face now and so you know what we're seeing now validates what the gnostics were saying uh 2000 years ago it's phenomenal but by the same token we have to take seriously not only the demiurge but us ourselves and the planet that's not just an Inan an, an, an inanimate it 
And, uh, you know, then we need to look back at the wisdom of indigenous peoples and, and more and more. So, yeah, that's, but that's, that's another very, very big topic. Yeah, well, well, we'll have time to get into it. For those of you listening, I have scheduled with Anna a series of four podcasts. This is the first one. Um, we worked together and Anna gave me a beautiful outline because I really felt that it's absolutely important for us and if, to understand these things. But even if you don't agree with these things or they seem completely like wild, then listen to it as a great story. But just remember how many stories have changed the way you live and look at how many of the what used to be sci-fi movies when we were kids. Some of you that are old enough to remember the beginning of, you know, George Jetson and and the original Star Wars movies and all those types of things. Those things have all become very, very real and very part of our lives. And so. Uh, I, I think, you know, my philosophy of learning is always to keep an open mind and to explore all possibilities and not to try to judge them as right or wrong, but just to let them sit inside of you and then see if as you look around at the world, you can find any correlations or connections that either affirm or deny based on your own experience. But if you just outright say this is just a bunch of bullshit then you're not really doing thinking you know this is why david bohm said real thinking is hard work that's why most people just rearrange their prejudices and call it thinking so in order to really appreciate someone with the depth that anna brings to us you really have to be capable of doing real thinking and real thinking is not a snap decision it's a gestation process. It's a digestive process. And it requires that you stand in the middle of judgment and allow what you're taking in to be present for observation and connection and your own inner experience. But belief systems, by definition, are closed. So the more programmed you are, against these kinds of ideas, the more likely you are to discount them without actually doing the work of asking, is it really true? And that makes you the kind of person that runs and gets yourself injected with something that could kill you or seriously disable you. And uh, so I think we all have enough knowledge of how that's playing out in the world. But to close out today, and uh, because I, I, I've really enjoyed this, I, I feel deeply grateful that you are willing to share uh, your knowledge and your book. Could you go ahead and share with us just a little bit for the listeners on where your where all this comes from? What is the basis of your own sense of credibility with this knowledge? Because I know it's more than you just digging up research and books and and using other people's ideas, I sense there's a deep level of um, inner truth here and that your soul is bringing you into an awareness of which ancient texts and, and etymologies are actually necessary for you to put to words what you know at a soul level. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah, I think it, it's important because, you know, people might feel kind of ambivalent. Um, well, to reassure the left brainers, um, I, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I've got all the academic credentials you need. I have three MAs and I have a PhD. I'm an anthropologist, but once I'd done the PhD and defended my thesis, I realized that, you know, academia is definitely not for me. I had already been 10 years, you know, amongst a particular esoteric uh, grassroots tradition of India amongst the, you know, the little people of the world. And they had given me a completely different perspective on everything. So, you know, I could no longer live with academia and I could no longer live in the West, actually. So, you know, I've been living in Asia for the past 20 plus years now. And I have been living among the little people, you know, I say that with a lot of affection, 
the poor people of the world who are those who produce the food, who do all the menial jobs, you know, they're the people who keep the world moving and they are still closer to the deepest truths. You know, having been raised upper middle class, urban, you know, um, all the education, all the this, that and the other, uh, transitioning from being that to becoming a barefoot peasant has been quite a long adventure and a long adventure of unlearning a hell of a lot while retaining my ability to be a rational human being. And at the same time, since I was initiated in what was an esoteric grassroots, very unorthodox grassroots tradition, I went also into the esoteric level of trying to perceive the subtle layers of reality, which, you know, gives basically three, there's a three-pronged perspective behind this book. There is the academic perspective, which involves my own, I hope, sufficient level of, you know, thoroughness in terms of reasoning and, um, you know, uh, rational intelligence, and also my ability to use sources. You know, I know a lot about many things in my capacity as an anthropologist, but I am not a deep historian nor a deep, you know, uh, specialist in economic or legal or other affairs. So I have had to lean on people who've done very deep work. So basically, you know, the the research part is what gives that sort of, I'm not going to say academic, let's say intellectual, logically relatively solid uh, grounding. But underneath that, there is a substratum of what I think is very unique amongst the people who are talking about what's happening in the world, ufology, um, uh, you know, poverty, uh, oppression, religion. Nobody is speaking from the perspective of the little man and woman. And because I've learned what their poverty is, and I think this is also very unique, and it's a major argument in the book, um, as we shall see later on. I have an understanding which is both visceral, and I've tried to articulate it in terms of how our systems have uh, impoverished these people, but what their fundamental wealth is. So I'm bringing a deeply human perspective from the grassroots level. Because, you know, they may speak, they may be interviewed, but then generally they are not very well understood by the educated person who interviews them, even with the best of intentions and, and affection. Uh, you know, living amongst the poor is, it's tough. And I have, and it's been a very slow process for me. You don't learn to live amongst the poor and with nature easily when you come from having read many books and having, you know, PhDs. It's a completely different adventure. And so this book is, the, it is fed as a constant undercurrent by a concern for the human dimension of the adventure of religion. And then there is my... Uh, personal sort of meditative or whatever, altered states of consciousness and work in uh, past lives, which also informs, let's say, the more esoteric aspect of what is highlight, what is brought, brought forth in this book, because you can't understand the way religion, religions as institutional systems of brain control, enslavement, and sacrifice work if you don't have the esoteric dimension. And so I have been initiated in a grassroots esoteric tradition. It is at the antipodes from the esoteric systems of the elites and of the many people who decipher, you know, be it Kabbalah or the astrotheology of the Bible or, you know, whatever. 
the perspective from the ground up is very, very different. And this is also another element that I bring to this book, which probably gives it another level of validity because I'm trying in this book to embody the lived experience of the little people, you know, the silent majority going through this adventure of humankind with nature, equally enslaved by these religions that hate and rape nature. Um, so, you know, to, so that there is, we can have a, a human perspective of this journey and not just an intellectual one, not just a historical one, so that we can have a lived experience of it, which, if I've done my job reasonably well, should elicit some emotions also. You know, I should say that in writing this book, I have wept torrents because of, you know, just the sheer accumulation of what has been done to humankind, our victimization. Um, you know, we can't afford to be too hard on ourselves today in our need to wake up because we have been deeply, deeply conditioned. On the other hand, we have the tools to crack out of the conditioning. But uh, basically, if you're looking at this journey from a human perspective and not dry intellectual, from a dry intellectual perspective, it is deeply emotional also. And this, in the end, is a treasure of humankind, is that we have our emotions and the gods don't have our emotions. There you are. I think... I really appreciate that. And I think that's um, a great springboard to help everybody understand where you're coming from as we uh, prepare for our second session. And uh, for those who want to go on this journey of deep exploration and self-reflection and really being present within themselves to feel what's being said instead of just intellectualizing it. I think uh, this four-part uh, process we're going to go through is a great way to uh, inspire people to read the book so that they can get every word and have their own experience. And even though I'm extremely busy, um, I committed to Anna that I will start reading her book for 20 minutes a day because I realize how critical it is. I, I read a couple of chapters and it just blew my mind and I s dropped everything and got a hold of her and said, I've got to have you on my podcast because this book is just bang on. And uh, so I had to share it with you guys because that's just why I do the podcast. I, I really do my very best to, to share things that will really help educate people, give them tools for their own spiritual growth and development, mental, emotional growth and development, and to help us all wake up to the opportunity that we have. Because as you mentioned earlier, human beings used to have a lot more ability. Steiner speaks quite a lot about how Human beings used to be fully clairvoyant and had a lot of abilities that we've lost and many other things. So that's not at all the first time I've heard that. You study the Aboriginal culture, you see the same things. There's many cultures that refer back to these things. So, Anna, what a phenomenal first uh, session together. Um, I'm very grateful. You know, you had to get up real early in the morning because you're way over in Thailand. And as, as you were saying that the sun was going up, I was watching the sun go down. So uh, we're on the yin and the yang of it together. <laughs> um, I just want to tell you, <laughs> I'm, I'm so grateful, Anna, for all the work and all the research you've done and, and for all the development you've done on yourself as a human being. I think you're a tremendous inspiration if not just to everybody, but to women, because I think from my experience, one of the sad things that's happened in the last 4,000 years in particular is women have really suffered probably worse than men with all this uh, 
abuse of human beings by religion. And all you got to do is read the Old Testament and the Bible to see the absolute destruction of the equality of human beings. And I've said many times, any woman that is a Christian obviously is not paying attention to the, to the roots of the teachings and the religion. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm just grateful well, to have you here. Well, I'm grateful to you. Mean, Paul, you are, it's, you know, it's one thing to have something to say, and it's another thing to have something to say that is heard and uh, understood by somebody else. Uh, so I'm really grateful to you. You are a fabulous host. And since you mentioned the business of being a woman, yeah, there's a big, we're going to have a big chunk of stuff to talk about in terms of the feminine. There are so many cliched understandings about that. I have gone really very, very, very deep on that topic. India forced me to do that. So, you know, we can... Um, we can we can have a, an interesting chit chat on that in one of the next uh, installments. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to it. You've got me very excited. I mean, I was very excited from the look. I'll tell you the truth. The instant that I opened the package, your book came in, and I saw the cover. I was hit by holy shit! This book is loaded. I can feel the vibration on a book. I don't even have to read it. I can just pick it up and feel the vibration. And I was in the, in my birthday party. It, I think I told you it came on my yeah. birthday. Yeah. And I was surrounded by all sorts of people. And I literally started looking through the book and reading it while people were trying to talk to me. I was so enthralled. The cover just pulled me in instantly because it has all the symbology that's exactly what's going on in the world today. Well, I mean, I can, I can, I'll, yeah, I'll put in a plug for the guy who did the, the cover design. <laughs> you know, he's, he did a great job. You know, he did a great job. He actually read the book, you know, kudos to him. So since you mentioned the, since you mentioned the, the cover and thank you for that too, uh, Paul, that's really, you know, very much appreciated. He did a great job. On, on, you know, conveying something that is, after all, pretty, pretty complex. Yes, very, very good. So before we leave people just completely and utterly frustrated with how the hell they're going to get a hold of this book, how do people get your book as immediately as I'm sure many of them want to get it? Okay, there is, um, there is an ebook which can be found basically on all the big platforms. It is uh, found, you know, I've put it up on Book Baby, which is a kind of aggregator distributor. So if you prefer the Amazons, uh, you can go to the Amazons. Um, if you want to support the book better, you can go to Book Baby, uh, uh, Narratort. Perhaps I'll send you the links, Paul. It'll be more convenient than trying to spill it out. Otherwise, I have a print version that I can send you from Thailand. But as you know, most of you are probably aware, there's a lot of disruption with the transport. And so um, this is the kind of book where people like Paul, uh, I know, like to do all sorts of scribbling and things like that. So the ebook might not be ideal. Uh, I am happy to send you an autographed print version, which will arrive who knows when. Um, I can also send a PDF that people can print out at home if they want a printed version at home. So people can write to me at my, at my, uh, my website and, um, and we can take it from there. Well, I should pay you for the PDF because you're giving the whole book away. You're going to, how do they do that? Yeah, well, you, we can do the. I mean, it can be the same price as the as the ebook, but basically they're saving, they're saving you know considerable transport cost also, um, and I'll send them you know the PDF. They can also have the, the 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 cover so that they can because the cover is such an important part you know as you've said, and uh, and like that. But, you know, if they want to read it quickly, then you know and and in print form, because I'm not even sure if I give it to print, 
uh, within, let's say, America, I mean, I can, you know, that can also be done. But I think the disruption in transport is only going to get worse and worse and worse. So for the time being, I don't, the book baby aggregator does not yet have it in print. Depending on what people tell me, if they want it in print, you know, uh, through that form, then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do the necess- I'll do the needful, as they say in India. Otherwise, I've got my stock of printed, locally printed here that I'm happy to autograph to people and send registered, you know, with all, you know, due whatever protections. Um, but it, who knows when it, when, when, when it'll arrive because things have gotten much worse since the time when you received the book, Paul. Okay, yes, and and uh, I want to just state for everybody, Anna Anna's last and his name is spelled E N N A. That's easy. Her last name is R E I T T O R T. So you, if you search her, you find the right person. And Anna, I would be absolutely blessed if you would email me the PDF so I can search it because it would make it much easier for me to find information to reference you in my new book. Oh, okay. Sure, absolutely. We'll be done. Cool. Well, I will. I'll close out by saying thank you so much to all of you for listening, for sharing my podcast, for helping put our hands together and really work together to create a field of higher consciousness and awakening out of love. And as Anna has nicely mentioned several times, we want to be gentle with people because they really are in a trance. They've been through a lot of trauma and um, many people are very caught in the brainwashing machine and don't realize it. You'll know how bad they're caught by how defensive they get and how negative they get when you try to tell them the truth. So the more heated they get, the more love they need and the softer you want to be with them. And I want to say thank you to my sponsors for all your beautiful products and sustainable practices. You're really a gift to the world. Thank you to all of you for anything you buy from the sponsors. A small percentage goes to me to help me uh, fund the podcast and to make it so I can take the time I need to uh, create and do everything I've got to do for the podcast. And so thank you all. It's been an amazing journey. It's only beginning with Enna. We're just getting warmed up. If you like today, tell everybody to get ready for session two, and we will continue until we have given you enough of Enna's wisdom to really enhance your life and help us all do what we came here to do in a more full, loving way. Enna, thank you. You're a blessing. Thank you, Paul. You're a blessing. Thank you very much. Take care. I'm glad we found each other. Lots of love, everybody. We are safe. We are home. We are whole. Aho, great spirit. It is done. It is done. It is done. Till next time. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Enna Reitort. If you enjoyed this episode, stay tuned for another episode where Enna explains how the church carefully manipulated the true story of Jesus for the specific and perpetual betrayal of humanity. To order signed paperback copies of Kreefda, The God Tricks Against the Matrix, please go to ennareitortbooks.com. That's E-N-N-A-R-E-I-T-T-O-R-T-B-O-O-K-S dot com and use the contact form at the bottom of the page. For the ebook version, go to bit.ly forward slash Kreevda the God Tricks. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash K-R-I-V-D-A-T-H-E-G-O-D-T-R-I-X. Follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast.